I, I counsel different couples, they saying, well, uh, I can win them over to the Lord. Like, wait a minute, that joker don't love Jesus. What's going to hold him back from putting his hands on him? There's no covenant that he has entered in with God, but you want to give him yourself? You want to give him all your body? You want to give him all your heart, your mind, your soul, your spirit? Man, that's out of the will of God. Because you got to understand that there are some things that's going to come along with that as a result of the choice that you decided to make as a child of God. And you want to go into the world. It already told us that here. It says, um, don't cross it with unequally, and don't be united with unequally young. It says they will um, fault, or they may um, have consolation under it. But when believers enter into the same union against the express of God's warning word, they must expect distress. They must understand that there's some things that's going to come along when you willingly disobey the will of God. Hallelujah. So much time and money can be saved. So much heartache can be saved from people if they would just take heed to what the Word of God is saying concerning their lives as far as being married. And, you know, of course, that rolls on to some other things as well. But again, since we're talking about marriage today. The factor of making the most difference is related, um, is rational, the commitment of practice of spending time with the Father, both corporately and individually. Because there's sometimes we as, as spouses, we need to spend that intimate time with the Father by ourselves. But also, we need to be able to get to a place where the whole family can come together, mother and father, um, husband and wife, and get together and teach the kids, and also just the two of them, just the two of us, should I say, to spend that intimate time with our father, you know, one with another. What appears to be um, intuitive, which is true, couples, couples who regularly practice any combination of serious religious behaviors and attitude, attending church, normally every week, doing Bible studies, they generally take their, their faith a little more seriously than, obviously, the non-believers. Living is not, you know, living a life of Christ is not perfect. We're not trying to be perfect disciples, but serious disciples. Enjoying the significantly the lower uh, divorce rate in the church. Because, again, what it's saying right here is those who, who practice their faith, faithful, not just being a nominal Christian, which I'll talk about that here shortly, not just being a church goer, or somebody who just stays at home and say, you know what, I'm good. Now, don't get me wrong, there's some people who, who stay at home and they fellowship with their family and with others and stuff like that, but I'm talking about not even practicing their faith at all, just saying I'm a Christian and don't, you know, don't know nothing about God. Just say, okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to miss hell, so I'm good to go. Yeah, I understand what I'm talking about. All right. Hallelujah. So, a study done by Professor Bradley Wright, a sociologist of the University of uh, Connecticut, explains this analyst to many people who identify themselves as Christians, but rarely attend church. He said that 60% of these have been divorced. Of those people who are called, so-called, plain church, or instead of just being the church, because you understand that even if we never get together here, we are the church. Amen? We need to understand that we are the body of Christ. But with that being said, don't get into religion because they're... Okay, thank you, Holy Spirit. Let me slow down. What's happening is people are playing church. Okay? We got to make sure that we explain to them that this thing, what we call uh, the walk of life of Christ, is about a personal relationship. It's not about um, um, I'm, I'm non-denominational or I'm Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, you know, all these different things or whatever. It's about a personal relationship with God. And if if uh, your husband, if you're already into them, if the brother ain't willing to cry, you might might want to watch out and vice versa. Because the thing about it is, some people say, "Well, I'm not emotional." <laughs> that that foot gets that you stomp that toe or or you slam your finger in the door, or somebody close to you um, dies or something like that. You don't cry. But the thing about it is, we need to make sure that we're teaching other young men and women that are trying to uh, come to you for a wise counsel. Say, oh, hey man, I'm thinking about getting married. First thing we should ask them, okay, do they have a relationship with God? Second thing, 
Okay, if they have a relationship with God, if it's a man seeking wisdom or seeking guidance or whatever, you ask him how what type of relationship he has with his father. Because if a joker, trust me, I know, if a man is going to treat or do anything type of, he treat his mother any old kind of way, what makes you think you're going to be so special? Hallelujah. Because I'm trying to tell you, if he doesn't reverence the woman of God who puts them out, what is it going to do to you? And we need to be able to properly explain that to people. And let them know, this relationship called marriage, it ain't going to be perfect every day. This ain't going to be no honeymoon every day. Because after you have the big wedding and you, you have the honeymoon or whatever, then you're going to have to live with them. Then you're going to have to live with her. If she call you out your name, you're like, wait a minute, I mean, you just, uh, what happened between here and there? And those are the type of things that you could have realized before you got into your marriage. Before, you know, with premarital counseling. Pre-marital um, things that we want to go through, we want to talk to them about. Okay, how many kids do you want to have? Um, do you do you believe in uh, put, having your money in the same account? Because there's a lot of people say, oh no, I, you know, I had a hundred thousand dollars. You had two dollars before you came into the relationship. I got my two dollars because I see it all the time. Just like we was watching, um, what was it, uh, Nene or something like that. <laughs> Y'all, you gotta watch that. Come on now, y'all ain't so so super safe now. Nah. I watched that. Okay, Tony, like, nah, no, nah, I don't watch that. <laughs> <laughs> Mimi had that Joker sign a prenup. So to me, you're already conditioning your mind for divorce because she remarried her husband and stuff like that. And people are watching this and they're thinking that this is okay. People in, even in the body of Christ are thinking, oh, it's okay, you know, I can get married and maybe we get divorced or whatever. You're going into that with a with an ill will already. You're already saying, well, you know what, in case it don't work. Okay, you know what, don't get, get out of my office because you are already coming into this mindset that it's not going to work. You don't even need to get together because get your covenant relationship right with Christ first because Christ never leaves us. He said he would never leave us nor forsake us. And the thing about it is, if we connect ourselves, our relationships like that, God would do the same for us. He would cover our marriage. Just like when that when, when the winds blow, when the when when things get a little shaky in our relationship. But if that foundation is strong, it'll be like, okay, you know, got some rocks, you know, some winds may blow or whatever. But once the dust settles, it's like, all right, man, love you. Because the Bible tells us, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. And I deal with that on a regular, y'all. And that's what we got to be able to get in a place where we understand what the Word of God says is concerning marriage. If you guys, uh, let me pause for, for a second here. It says, um, on uh, right here. If you turn to Mark chapter 10, verse number 9, real quick scripture, it says... Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Romans, Mark, excuse me, Mark chapter 10, 9 said, Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate you. So, if you already know that God has joined you guys together, there's no way in the world that we should allow the world, one, to give us counsel. Because the Bible tells us, don't seek counsel from the ungodly. How, what can an ungodly person tell me? concerning my God and my covenant relationship with God. And that's what we need to understand. Because if we don't, we will be just like the world. We'll just be just like them doing, living our lives and living our marriage just like them. And that's not what we're trying to do. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. So, we need to make sure that we check the scriptures for ourselves. I want to tell, uh, excuse me, what I'm talking about is take the time to seek God's face concerning marriage. So, ask those hard questions. Have those long conversations. Okay, man, where do you want to live? What is your plans for 10 years from now? How are you going to make some money? How are we, how are we going to do this? Um, do you want to, uh, are we going to, I'm going to this particular ministry right now. Are you going to try to go to the same one? Okay, what is your personal relationship? Are you spending time with the Father? Are you going to uh, spank the kids? I mean, it's just so many things that people are, uh, yeah, I, I, are you going to spank the kids? Because the Bible says, spare the rod, spoil the child. I ain't telling y'all to abuse your children, but you need to tap that joke, hey, get, get them in line. Because again, you're trying to save their lives. 
Because the world, they don't care nothing about it. They'll lock them up, put them in a cage or whatever, and say, okay, next. And they don't care nothing about it. And then we're at home now. That's causing uh, ruckus in our, in our home. That's causing problems in our home with our marriage because we didn't do, take the time out to do what we needed to do to raise our children properly. And now, as a couple, we're fighting and why don't you say, okay, well, it was your fault. We went, you know, point fingers or whatever. Instead of taking the time out to do what God called us to do. So, I ask you guys, what is a nominal Christian? You have any idea what a nominal Christian is? No? Okay, I'll tell you. It indicates a position without power or attributes that what God should do with that position. Perfect example. Being a king, a king considered being a ruler, but who quite obviously lacks the authority or to make and enforce the laws of his own country, providing himself to be the only nominal ruler after all. So thus, we have nominal Christians. Nominal Christians can be defined as religious, but not godly. So, you guys know some people like that? Okay, not, that's, not, that's not anybody in this place. Hallelujah. But many, the Bible says in, in uh, John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But as many have received him, to them gave power to become sons of God, even of them that believed in his name. So essentially, he is the one who does not, he don't believe, but he believes that he wants, he wants to share his relationship with the Lord. So we don't want to be, or if we see a nominal Christian, we want to let them know, you can't share your lordship of your life. You know, God is either Lord of all or look not Lord at all. So we've got to make sure that we're teaching people, to help them understand that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life. Once you give your life to Christ, your life don't belong to you anyway. There's some things that you have to do concerning this marriage. There's some things that you have to do concerning this relationship that would affect the whole family. Hallelujah. But, also, Matthew um, chapter 7 it says that not, not everyone that saith unto the Lord, 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 shall enter into this kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven, many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, I have prophesied in thy name, and he, I have cast out devils in thy name. And the Lord, he will say, depart from you do of iniquity, I never knew. Man, that's a hard saying. Could you imagine getting to the gate and you maybe been a preacher or, or you know, teach Bible study or you've been living you know, living that holy life, so to speak, or whatever, and God, you get to heaven before the Father and He say, Depart from me, you do of iniquity, I never knew you. Man. Sometimes that right there alone just kind of gets gets my mind gets my spirit going and makes me try, like, try to do whatever I can to be pleasing unto God. Because I know that no matter what I do, I can't do enough. Because you know, the Bible talks about uh, my works is as, as filthy rags. But the thing about it is I need to try to humble myself and give my life totally to God and pray and have the faith that He won't, when I get to heaven, He won't say, depart from me, do, do it of iniquity. Because you know, we talked about how, how God told Samuel. He said, I look at the heart of a man anyway. So oftentimes, again, we can't get so caught up on the deeds or the works or whatever, but try to live our lives as pleasing unto God as we best know how. Hallelujah. So, here we go. John 15, um, last chapter. He said, John 15, we're going to start at verse number 17. If you're there, I'll wait for you. Yes, Lord. Yes, hallelujah. You there? Yes. All right. Verse number 8 on 17. It says, This is my command. Love each other. If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own. But if you belong to it, but you are no longer a part of the world, I choose to come out of the world so it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than the master. Since they persecuted me, naturally, they will persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would have listened to you. They will do all this to you because of me. 
for they have rejected one who, the one who sent me. They would not be guilty if they had not come and spoken to them. But now they have no excuses for their sin. Anyone who hates me also hates my father. If I had done such a miraculous signs among them that no one else could do, they would not be guilty. But as but as it is, they have seen everything I did. Yet they have they still hate me and my father. This fulfills what is written in their scriptures. They hated me without cause. But they will send you an advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father, and they will testify all about me. I pray, therefore, that in this place, that no one under the sound of my voice will, will fall, allow this word to fall on shaky ground, that they will allow this word to be germinated, germinated in their spirit. Please, 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 take this covenant that we call marriage seriously. Because there may be some things that, that your spouse or um, someone, a family member or whatever, didn't quite understand about what happened in their previous relationship. You know, might say, well, I have family members that got divorced that, who were saved, and I know that they were saved. Okay, understand. But now, we need to get to a place where we share the love of God and say, okay, you can forgive them, you can go and forgive them for divorcing your father or divorcing your mother or what happened. Because I shared you guys, I shared your story, my story with you. Um, my, my mother wasn't married to my father. And as a result of that, maybe whatever it is that he was doing out there in the street, he was killed. But the thing about it is we don't want to be in a place where our, the ones who we're mentoring, the ones who are seeking the godly counsel concerning marriage, because again, sometimes they think you got to have it all perfect. My kids got to be on the honor roll, or or um, my my wife got to have a, a job or two, three jobs. With my husband doing all these things or whatever. I tell you, if we get that foundation tight, allow God to do what He needs to do in our lives. Share that word with God. Encourage one another. Tell your husband. I'm, I'm gonna start out with my men, wives. Tell your husband that he still look good. Tell them that, you know what, baby? Don't lie to them now. <laughs> Tell that joker he still looks just almost just as good as he did when you first married him. Tell him that, you know, I, my, my heart hit a pass when you step in the room. The way that you kiss me, you hug me, you rub my neck or whatever. And then, my brothers, ah, I'm preaching to myself now. Ah, rub your wife's feet when she needs you to rub them fit. <laughs> Because I'm telling you, that, that that goes a long way. Rub her feet. Because sometimes she's so tired with dealing with the kids or dealing with some of the same things that you may have dealt with. And at, naturally as husbands, we, we want we want some, you know, want that that uh, that special attention when we come in the house. But think about all the things that she's been doing. Think about she's paying the bills. I'm talking in my own house. Paying the bills, taking care of the children, washing the clothes, cleaning up after you, making love to you when you need it or when you want it, and even sometimes when she don't want it. And most importantly, being that woman of God. Man, that's... That, I know there's a lot of jokers out there envy that. But husbands, let's get on, man. Let's, let's do whatever it is that we need to do to make sure that our wives are getting what we need. You know, take, take the bath off of me. Wash your feet. Do whatever you need to do, you know. Because one, sometimes, for me, for example, because I can only talk about me, I talk to couples a lot about trying to enter into a covenant relationship with God. But sometimes that husband, I joke, he a lot to me. Okay, let me, let me, let me say. Sometimes that I have men that come to me that are trying to get some wise counsel about what their wife did or what their you know spouse is doing or whatever, and then they'll lie about it. One thing I learned, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna you know put this out here to you: if you're ever counseling a couple, get both of them together because he's gonna tell his story, she's gonna tell her story, 
and then the truth is somewhere in the middle. Make sure you let